Welcome to the New Testament Review, where every episode we discuss an influential work of New Testament scholarship. I'm Laura Robinson. I'm Ian Mills. And we are PhD candidates at Duke University. Today we're discussing Donald Sr.'s article, The Death of Jesus and the Resurrection of the Holy Ones, Matthew 27, 51 through 53. Uh, happy Easter, Ian. Yeah, happy Easter. And uh, we're discussing, I think, one of the craziest passages in the Gospels. Right. <laughs> Matthew's zombies. So the Gospel of Mark, in describing Jesus' death, has the sun go dark and the temple veil rent. This is classic eschatological imagery, the language the Jewish prophets use to describe the end of the world. Matthew takes that over and adds in a bunch of other really cool stuff. And one of these things are a bunch of people rising from the dead and walking into Jerusalem. Yeah, specifically holy figures from Israel's past. We are piously referring to them as Matthew zombies today, uh, but they are they go by all kinds of names. Donald Senior calls them the holy one, the risen holy ones, uncreatively. Matthew twenty-seven fifty. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now, when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and they said, Truly this man was the son of God. That was a very good John Wayne impression. (laughs) (laughs) Supposedly, when John Wayne first delivered that line, the director, a little bit unimpressed, said, Okay, John, this time do it with awe. And John Wayne responded, Ah, truly this man was the son of God. (laughs) Yeah, so what you'll hear in that, some of this is just borrowed wholesale from Mark's gospel. The Jesus crying out with a loud voice, and then he dies. The tearing of the curtain temple... And then the statement of the centurion after he watches Jesus die, that truly this man was God's son, all that is from Mark. But then Matthew gets all of his own fun stuff that he throws in there. He says that the earth shook and the rocks were split, and then that the tombs were opened, and that the bodies of holy people who were in there were raised. And then we have this very confusing time detail that after his resurrection, they came out from the tombs and they went into Jerusalem and they appeared to people. An interesting little redactional detail is that those are the sites that make the centurion say, truly, this was God's son. In Mark, it's explicitly linked to watching Jesus die, right? And in Matthew, it's seeing these supernatural events culminating in the resurrection of the Holy Ones in their journey into Jerusalem. And we will come back to that. Where Senior starts his article is from the question of where did Matthew get this idea that after the death of Jesus, saints were raised and went into Jerusalem? Where did he get this? Because he didn't get it from Mark, right? Matthew got a lot of these other details from Mark. But this very particular image, he didn't get it from Mark. Luke doesn't pick it up. John doesn't pick it up. This is unique to Matthew. So if Matthew didn't get this from anybody else and nobody else got this from Matthew, where did Matthew get this very idiosyncratic detail? So Senior surveys a few previous proposed explanations for the Mithian zombies. A scholar named Hutton had suggested that Matthew and the Gospel of Peter were drawing on a common lost source or tradition. And we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because this theory and the sort of the nexus of ideas around it have really fallen out of favor. Um, John Dominic Crossan was a big advocate of what we call, or what he called the cross gospel, this lost source common to Peter in the synoptics. I think it's been demonstrated quite compellingly that the gospel of Peter is dependent on redactional material that shows up in Matthew's reworking of Mark and so is actually post Mathean. And so a better explanation for the commonalities, the shared material between the Gospel of Peter and Matthew, is not that they both had an earlier gospel, but rather that Peter was reading Matthew. The scholar W. Schenck had another theory that instead of getting this image of the risen saints from an earlier gospel that predated both Matthew and Peter, 
that Matthew is getting this imagery from a Jewish apocalyptic hymn. And Shane particularly got this idea because of the style that Matthew 27, 51 to 53 is written in. Th this passage shows a lot of what we call parataxis. And parataxis is sort of this rhythmic repetition, every line beginning with the same phrase. Laura went to the store and filled her grocery cart and picked food and went home and baked supper. That's parataxis. Yeah. You can kind of hear parataxis even when you read the English in Matthew, right? That um, and the and the curtain of the temple was torn, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split, and the tombs of many were opened, and the many were raised. So what Shank argues is that, for the most part, when Matthew reworking passages in Mark that use parataxis, he tends to make them hypotactic instead. Instead of using this repetitive and this and that and this, he uses subordinate clauses to try to make it a bit more grammatically neat. So Shank's argument is that because Matthew suddenly uses parataxis here, he must have gotten it from somewhere else, right? Like Matthew, when he writes in his own style, doesn't use parataxis, so he must be using this other source that uses parataxis. Senior's reply to this is that actually, if you look not just at the teachings of Jesus and things like that, but at places where Matthew narrates a series of events, Matthew does in fact employ parataxis. So twice in Matthew 7, actually, Matthew rewrites Mark and introduces and makes Mark more rather than less paratactic. And this undermines any warrant we would have for looking for a pre mathean source. This, it turns out, is sort of just the way Matthew writes, and we're going to have more evidence for that in a second. The big insight that Senior gets from Shank's article, however, is the connection with Ezekiel 37. So Shank had thought that maybe this Jewish hymn that was being pulled over into Matthew was derived or in some way dependent on Ezekiel 37. And this Senior, and most reception of this passage subsequently, has thought is exactly right. Yeah, so Ezekiel 37 is a passage that becomes really popular in uh, Second Devil Jewish literature about the apocalypse and about the eschatological restoration of Israel. And this is a prophetic passage where Ezekiel receives this vision of dry bones. Ezekiel is, uh, he sees a bunch of dry bones that are scattered all over the valley, and God tells him to prophesy to them, and when he does, this wind goes through the valley and connects all the bones together, and sinews and flesh covers them, and he has this giant army standing where the dry bones used to be. Okay, so here's how the passage ends. This is Ezekiel 37, 11 to 13. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophecy and say to them, thus says the Lord your God, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. So what we have here is a passage we know Second Temple Jewish readers were interpreting as eschatological. There's lots of evidence for this. Mm -hmm. Donald Sr. himself points to uh, the Dura Europa Synagogue, which has a portrait of this with reference to the future messianic age. And the proposal that we think is absolutely right is that Matthew has rewritten Mark to agree with Jewish expectations about the Messiah and about the end of the world. So Matthew has seen in Mark these echoes of eschatological language and introduced into it more signs of the end of the world. Yeah, no, exactly. So the, the argument here is that Matthew has an expectation of what the eschatological and the Messianic age will look like that he's gotten from the Hebrew Bible. And he's working a lot of material from the Hebrew Bible into his narrative in a thoroughgoing way to, to bring this idea out, right? The classic example of Matthew doing this is the triumphal entry narrative in Matthew's Gospel. In Mark, Jesus rides a donkey into Jerusalem, and he's hailed with people waving palm branches and um, throwing their cloaks on the road. But what Matthew has, instead of Jesus riding a donkey, is Jesus riding a donkey and a baby donkey at the same time. And why does he need both of these to get into Jerusalem? 
Because Matthew is reading Zechariah, and Zechariah 9 says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, people familiar with Hebrew poetry will recognize that here we have classic parallelism. We have the donkey and also the foal of the donkey, a redescription of one animal. But it seems reading this in Greek, Matthew has identified this as two separate creatures and introduced into Mark a second animal upon which Jesus is riding. So, like we are proposing happened in Matthew 27 with the Mithian zombies, Matthew has read something in Mark, thought of a Hebrew scripture, and added in a new character, in this case a young donkey, for Jesus to ride in on and fulfill what Matthew takes to be messianic prophecy. Matthew tends to not be big on subtlety in these ways. A lot of things that are just sort of like lightly alluded to in Mark, or you're supposed to hear the reference if you're really paying attention. Matthew likes to really make sure you got it. And a great illustration of that is back in Matthew 27, just before the, the earthquake and zombies. Mark has people mocking Jesus, which is a sort of subtle allusion to the sorts of mockery that happens in Psalm 22. And Matthew just adds in an explicit quotation right there. He has the people actually sort of allude in their mocking to the psalm. So to clarify, we have the same pattern. Just a few verses earlier, we have Mark subtly alluding to a psalm. Matthew sees that and adds in a few extra statements to make the scriptural fulfillment really, really clear. Yeah. One image uh, that Matthew brings in, uh, that's a great example of Matthew bringing in these tropes of the eschatological age. Uh, this is right before the risen holy one slash risen zombies, whatever you want to call them, uh, shows up. And this is when Matthew adds an earthquake. And this is not the only earthquake that happens in Matthew. Matthew actually really likes earthquakes and he keeps putting them in the book. Matthew adds three <laughs> earthquakes to Mark. And my favorite one that doesn't often show up in English translation is in the stilling of the storm. So in Mark, there a storm comes up and there's wind and there's waves and the disciples get scared and go wake up Jesus, right? Well, Matthew calls this storm, the word Mark has for storm, Matthew replaces with seismos. He has an earthquake. Joel Marcus has a phenomenal article on this called Does Matthew Believe His Myths? One of the things he points out is that Matthew keeps Mark's language about waves and wind. Now, waves isn't that big of a deal. Earthquakes can cause waves. No problem there. The problem is that earthquakes don't cause wind. And Joel Marcus asks himself, why on earth would Matthew do this? Why would he take the stilling of the storm, which is a perfectly good Christophanic story, and replace the storm with an earthquake? And his answer is, there's a ton of Second Temple Jewish literature that are reading the Hebrew Bible that describe earthquakes as accompanying the arrival of the Messiah. And so in this event, in which the disciples recognize Jesus as the Messiah, it is only appropriate for Matthew, who is very familiar with this eschatological literature of Judaism, that Jesus' works be accompanied by earthquakes. Mark has in his eschatological discourse, uh, Jesus say that earthquakes will appear in the end times. He says this in Mark 13. Matthew just takes this eschatological image of the end of the world and shoots it back into his narrative, which is a thing that Matthew loves to do. The point that we're trying to get at with the earthquakes is that we can see places where Matthew has already taken eschatological language from the Hebrew Bible, from uh, from Second Temple Jewish eschatological traditions, and retrojected them into his narrative and reworked them in his rewriting of Mark uh, to make them part of this historical story of Jesus, to bring this, these eschatological themes the whole way through the text. So, just like Matthew did this with earthquakes, he took earthquakes and he put them at big eschatological moments in the text, what we're arguing, and what Senior is arguing, is that Matthew is doing the same thing with the resurrected saints, right? That he is taking this image from the Old Testament that signifies the this coming of the eschatological age, and he's working it into his crucifixion narrative because that's what Matthew does. And what does Ezekiel say? Ezekiel says that I, God, will break open the graves, the righteous will rise up out of them, and they will march into Israel. Now, in the context of Ezekiel, this has to do with the restoration of the exiled Israelites. 
so they're actually marching from other countries into Israel, but they can't really do that in Matthew. Their tombs outside <laughs> they're already of there. yeah, exactly. <laughs> their tombs outside of Jerusalem. So what do they do? Well, it's pretty much the same story. You have the graves split open, the dead rise up, and they march into Jerusalem. Okay, so assuming we've convinced you all that this is in fact how Matthew is writing, rewriting Mark, there are some serious parallels to this between this podcast and my dissertation. <laughs> Let's look at how this changes and affects the way we read Matthew. I would argue that the biggest change that, that Matthew makes from Mark is the role of the centurion in the story. In the Gospel of Mark, the centurion is presiding over Jesus' death. He sees Jesus die. And then he says, surely this was the son of God. So some people have argued that the centurion is not supposed to be, this is an argument that Joel Marcus and I think Mark Goodacre has this in print too. Uh, the centurion is not being sincere in the gospel of Mark. The centurion is looking at Jesus who said he was the son of God, who barely lasted three hours on the cross, looks at him die and says, yeah, that's, that's a son of God. All right. Right. Uh, and this would fit really well with a major tendency in Mark, that Mark really loves irony as a mode of revelation. That whenever Jesus is at his most humiliated and his most in his weakest is when the fullness of who he is is actually being revealed. And Joel Marcus has an article on this topic that is one of my all-time favorite articles. That is, Crucifixion is Parodic Exaltation. And he points out that over and over again, Mark has people ironically, non-sincerely, say things about Jesus that the author of Mark believes are true. And so there are people in Mark 14 who are mocking Jesus who say things. There's the uh, titulus that says he's the king of Israel, which, which presumably whoever wrote that. The pinnacle of this, of course, is the crucifixion itself, which is described as a sort of raising up and enthronement, which Mark sees as true, but presumably the people crucifying him and hailing him king of Israel, putting a crown of, of thorns on him, aren't intending sincerely. So this fits in a Markan pattern of irony, of opponents hostile to Jesus saying things about him or doing things that Mark wants to tell you, the reader, are in fact true. The way Matthew takes this material then of the centurion derisively and insincerely saying, this is truly the son of God, in response to the death of Jesus, Matthew completely flips the story on its head. Instead of watching Jesus die, the centurion is watching everything go bananas. He's watching a major earthquake. He's watching tombs break open. He's watching dead people come to life. And once the centurion sees all this, then he says, surely this was the son of God, which is clearly sincerely meant, I think, in response to these things, that this is a supernatural thing. And it turns the moment that the centurion speaks not into to an ironic confession, but into a very sincere and truthful one. The role of the centurion has become really different. Once again, we have Matthew not being terribly subtle. Mark is kind He's of... He's not a subtle guy. <laughs> yeah. Mark, I think, is a sort of ironic genius. And Matthew here is sort of throwing it in your face. Um, <laughs> Matthew thinks you're stupid. <laughs> one interesting theological payoff for reading this, though, is we have now in Matthew not only signs of like calamity, which we have in Mark, but also an explicit act of God's vindication, Senior points out, accompanying Jesus' death. Raising people from the dead, the holy ones from their graves, is God intervening into the world in an act of salvation. And that accompanying Jesus' death, Senior argues, points to soteriological and salvation historical significance for the death itself. So to be clear, the contrast is a bunch of really traditionally, classically bad stuff happens when Jesus dies in Mark. In Matthew, we have Jesus' death itself being accompanied by a traditional act of God vindicating a figure or God intervening to make something good happen. Yeah, he performs this sign of salvation and uh, that accompanies the death of Jesus, uh, which makes the death of Jesus, it, it, it's it's a lot less bleak than it is in Mark. In Mark, I think there, there really isn't anything to soften the blow of the crucifixion scene. It's pretty much as bleak and as brutal as you can get. Uh, but in Matthew, we have this sign of salvation that comes immediately after the death of Jesus. Yep. Very different from the Gospel of Mark. And interestingly, Matthew is one of the few authors who seems to assign salvific significance to the death qua death. 
for Matthew, the death results in the forgiveness of sins. And while we are so accustomed to that being sort of the way Christians think about salvation, it's remarkable how rare that is in the New Testament. Luke doesn't ever say that. Paul pretty much never says this. Paul seldom talks about forgiveness, period. But yeah. ties, deliverance, justification, setting right language with Jesus' resurrection as often as anything else. And to be fair, Mark has this trace, die and give his life as a ransom for many thing. It's hardly a major theme running through the gospel. I mean, Matthew has already been more interested in the idea that Jesus' blood has redemptive and salvific significance. But by making the death of Jesus itself a salvific and redemptive moment, Matthew brings this theme home a lot more than the other gospel writers do. All that is to say, this image of the Holy Ones rising from their tombs and going into Jerusalem tends to get glossed over when people do their passion readings for a uh, good friday it tends to not make it into the easter pageant it tends to be something that we don't really talk about a lot it is strange as it is and as foreign as it seems to the crucifixion story it's doing really important work in matthew's gospel and it's carrying a lot of weight to explain how matthew sees the crucifixion of jesus functioning in salvation history so yes, Matthew is taking over Mark's signs of the end of the world and adding a few more of his own. But in reaching back to Ezekiel and taking over this particular sign, this act of God saving Israel, he actually transforms what these mean. No longer is it just God's judgment upon the world, but also an act of God's salvation. Jesus' death is a moment for Matthew where God intervenes to save his people. Well, happy Easter, Laura. Happy Easter, Ian. Thanks for talking about this uh, very interesting topic and uh, a good article. Yeah, we hope yeah. you all are staying safe and not going to large Easter gatherings. If you're the kind of people who celebrate Easter, thanks for uh, listening in and joining us on the, for this holiday episode. If you're not, we hope you enjoyed some talk of zombies. <laughs> stay inside and stay safe, everybody. Stars and 